From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. Now, here's your host and bud tender, Gary Johnston. And let me welcome you back to the Cannabis Podcast. This is episode 127, believe it or not. Perhaps this is your very first visit. Maybe you missed the 126 before this one. (laughs) You can go back and check them out. But if this is your first visit, an especially warm welcome for you. Ahead, we've got 30 or 40 minutes about cannabis, which happens to be my favorite plant. Now, before we get too much further, let me remind you this program is intended only for those 19 or older in your jurisdiction and is intended purely for entertainment and perhaps educational purposes. You should always consume your cannabis responsibly. In this episode, we have a story from Kenigma.com on how cannabis affects sleep. One of the biggest issues around the world is people being able to get a good night's sleep, so we have a story on that. Plus, did you know that the Cannabis Act review is underway? It's true. (laughs) It's been going on for a while now. We have some further details from MJBiz Daily on what exactly is happening with that review. And unfortunately, some unfortunate news. Tantalus Labs has laid off the majority of their workforce. One of the victims of the current situation in the cannabis world here in Canada, with excessive taxes really challenging many companies for their survivability. We have a story on that. On Cultivar Corner, it is Tribal's Turple. No, it's not Quirkle, but it had similar components. Tribal Turple on Cultivar Corner. All of that and more on episode 127 of the Cannabis Podcast. And I want to start this episode with, for what is for all intents and purposes, another edition of Your Cannabis Story. It's something I've talked about a few episodes ago, and we've heard a few people's cannabis stories from Rob and Tony, and there's probably a couple I'm forgetting as well. Remember, I smoke cannabis, so my memory is not perfect. However, I received an email this week from someone who listens to the podcast. Kylie is your name. Hey, Kylie, thank you so much for sending the email and all your kind words. And in fact, it in essence is her cannabis story. So I'm going to read a good portion of what she wrote to me. I just wanted to send you a quick email to let you know how much I appreciate your podcast. I've learned so much from it, and I'm so glad to have not only a Canadian cannabis podcast, but a Western Canada one. I live in Calgary, Alberta. I actually worked full-time in a hospital mental health unit for 20 years. Due to the economy and a sudden death in the household, I realized I needed a second job. Nowhere would hire me without any retail experience, but... I noticed a lot of cannabis jobs on Indeed. I got the needed paperwork and courses and was hired pretty quickly. Here's where you come in. As someone who smoked as a teenager, and being with a boyfriend for four years who's a regular smoker, I thought I knew enough. I quickly realized I had no idea what I was doing and couldn't answer any customer questions. My entire world became cannabis. YouTube, books, Instagram, blogs, Reddit, podcasts, and any other media, soaking it up like a sponge. Your podcast was instrumental in my journey. You explain things so well, have the most soothing but captivating voice, and have great guests and topics. I'm always able to keep up with conversations or tell my co-workers something new because of you. I look forward to your new episodes and listen to them usually twice in case I miss something. I just celebrated my one-year anniversary of my dispensary, and I absolutely love it. It's one of the best things to happen to me. I'm now a regular user, and I've got so many friends and family onto it for whatever ailment or recreational need. It's so rewarding to have people come in and say things like, That joint you recommended for my brother's wedding was awesome. It was a big hit. Or, that gummy you recommended gave me the best sleep I've had in 10 years. How can I thank you? I'm hoping to one day work solely in cannabis and leave my soul-sucking hospital job. Until then, I have lots of good pot to smoke at the end of my workday. So again, thank you for your hard work on the podcast. Know how appreciated you are and how you have impacted my life. Your fan, Kylie. Thank you so much, Kylie. That just pumped me up this week. I really appreciated getting that. It's always nice to hear that the podcast is having a positive impact on those who are listening. Thanks again. And remember, if you want to share your cannabis story, you're welcome to do so. You can send it along to info at CannabisPodcast.com. It's just another step that we all need to take to get rid of that stigma against cannabis. From the Cannabis Infused Studio in the Clouds, this is the Cannabis Podcast.
And this, unfortunately, is a story that I was hoping we would never have to tell on the Cannabis Podcast. We've been talking about the struggles of the Canadian cannabis industry, especially with the excessive excise tax being applied across the country and the problems that's creating for so many companies. This is a story from StratCan.com. BC's Tantalus Labs lays off majority of workforce as it files for restructuring. Dan Sutton, the company founder, announced today that Tantalus Labs has filed a notice of intent for restructuring in Canadian federal court. Sutton says Tantalus is laying off the substantial majority of its team, retaining only a few key employees to navigate the complexity of this restructuring process. He also says the company seeks to find a path forward for our brand and winning products to continue to deliver value to customers and distributors nationwide. Despite continued market success by firms like Tantalus, the regulatory and taxation environment is persistently so burdensome that even today, five years into recreational legalization, free cash flow in the Canadian cannabis industry remains systematically challenged, says Sutton. Tantalus is not alone, he adds. In a recent survey of 120 small cannabis cultivators across Canada, 85% indicated that they believe their businesses will become insolvent over the next six months. No company of any size has been able to consistently demonstrate a sustainable business model given an excise tax rate of 25 to 45 percent of gross sales. This is a difficult day for Tantalus employees, shareholders, and creditors. And our only consolidation is the knowledge that each individual on our exceptionally talented team worked tirelessly to persist as long as we could in these challenging conditions. Several former employees with the company shared the news on social media as well. I will say that Tantalus was a dream, and the people I met and had the pleasure of working with have been some of the biggest blessings, shared Catherine L. on LinkedIn, a former Ontario sales manager with Tantalus. The greenhouse cannabis grower, located in BC's Lower Mainland, operated initially under a medical cannabis license before expanding into the non-medical recreational market following full legalization in 2018. With a focus on sun-grown cannabis as a brand, Tantalus was also the recipient of a $2.9 million grant and contribution from the federal government for an expansion of its greenhouse. Following the rapid expansion of the cannabis market in the lead-up to legalization and the first few years following, the industry has been undergoing some contraction recently, forcing companies to reconfigure business operations to meet current market demands or, in some cases, closing the business entirely. Fire and Flower, a sizable retail cannabis chain, recently filed for CCAA protection. Navaya Incorporated, a Quebec-based cannabis company, filed an NOI on May 16th listing approximately $34.7 million in liabilities. On May 23rd, Dynaleo Incorporated and Dynaleo Group Services filed a notice of intention to make a proposal as well. In April, Fina Holdings, formerly CanTrust, announced they were closing operations. Last December, MJ Biz reported that 40% of the CCAA filings in Canada between January and December 22 involve companies operating in the cannabis space, most of them cannabis producers. MJ Biz also covered the growing unpaid tax bill from many cannabis producers, including comments from Tantalus CEO and founder Dan Sutton. Sutton has also been one of the leading voices trying to draw attention to industry challenges regarding high taxation rates and the impact of that on the ability of businesses to maintain profitability. It's no exaggeration to say that Unfortunately, all businesses of any size in the production and processing side of the cannabis industry today cannot pay their own bills and cannot make ends meet, Sutton said earlier this year. So that's not a great next chapter in the cannabis story. Tantalus Labs virtually laying off their entire staff, going through some restructuring. Hopefully they can turn some things around and still find their space in the cannabis space. This industry truly does still have some challenges ahead. One of the biggest issues for everyone in North America is sleep. If you talk to people, that's probably the biggest problem people have is getting that good night's sleep. Well, I don't really have much problem sleeping, perhaps because I am a daily consumer of cannabis. I did find when I took my tolerance break recently, that was the biggest impact for me. I did not sleep as well. It took me a long time to fall asleep. Now that I have returned to cannabis use, I fall asleep real quickly, and I have a pretty good sleep. This is a story from Kenigma.com about how cannabis affects sleep. Nearly one in three adults in the United States deals with short-term insomnia, while 10% struggle with various chronic sleep disorders. Many turn to a range of sleep aids to remedy the situation, from pharmaceutical sleeping pills to melatonin. 
As cannabis becomes accessible in more states and countries, it also becoming an increasingly popular alternative. Numerous studies have shown that cannabis can indeed help people with sleep problems, though more thorough randomized controlled trials would solidify the consensus. A complete understanding of exactly how it impacts our sleep schedules has also not been fully developed. One reason that scientists and doctors still have so many questions about cannabis and sleep lies in our nascent understanding of the endocannabinoid system, or the ECS, the body system of neurotransmitters that helps regulate a number of functions, including sleep stability. Scientists didn't even know about the ECS until the late 1980s. That, alongside the long-time prohibitions on medical cannabis research, means that most definitive statements about cannabis and sleep that science has for us today is, it depends. A 2017 analysis of the effects of cannabis on sleep, health, and workplace safety concluded that lab studies are unlikely to reflect the user's naturalistic experiences of sleep and of cannabis use in the present day due to the multitude of factors affecting each consumer's experience. Studies on specific consumption methods, such as vaping and dabbing, are particularly lacking. Absorption rate and bioavailability are both dependent on the consumption method. In the years since the study was published, few new revelations have been made. But that doesn't mean there isn't data available. While there aren't many scientific studies that look directly at sleep and cannabis, there are many that nevertheless observe the effects of cannabis on sleep. Such ancillary results are often found in studies on pain management and other conditions where cannabis is being studied as a possible treatment. This is of immense value because insomnia is often a symptom of another condition that may potentially be treated with cannabis. A 2010 randomized study of 21 people with chronic neuropathic pain found that patients experienced significant improvements when consuming three daily doses of 25 mg of 9.4% THC cannabis. Other studies have had less encouraging results. A 2008 study found that higher THC strains have the ability to lessen the amount of REM sleep. A more recent study from 2015 determined that regular cannabis use can actually impair sleep. A 2014 University of Glasgow study of chronic pain expanded its subject pool to 246 patients. Instead of smoking cannabis flower, the research subjects used a sublingual THC CBD spray during the 15-week double-blind placebo-controlled group study. Overall, the researchers found that a meaningful proportion of otherwise treatment-resistant patients experienced improvements in their sleep. THC and CBD are just two of at least 140 cannabinoids in the cannabis plant. Each of these cannabinoids reacts differently in the human body. For example, THC and CBD have many similar effects, but CBD does not produce the psychotropic effects that THC does. A 2017 study of cannabinoids and specific sleep disorders looked at two animal studies using CBD to determine its effect on sleep quality and the sleep-wake cycle. One of the studies found that a higher dose of CBD REM caused increased rapid eye movement, sleep latency, or the time it takes to reach the REM stage of sleep. This effect comes despite cannabis showing the potential to put people in a deeper sleep. The other animal CBD study reported a decrease in anxiety-induced REM sleep suppression. This effect was credited to CBD blocking such reactions while having no impact on non-rapid eye movement stages of sleep or dreamless sleep. The report also cited various findings to suggest CBD and THC combined may be useful while THC alone, as well as synthetics, decreases sleep latency. Most of the studies and anecdotal findings suggest that CBD has few to no adverse side effects on patients with sleep issues. Aside from a small number of cases, often with high doses, most people appear to respond well to CBD. A 2019 case series focusing on the effect of CBD on anxiety and sleep reported that CBD was well tolerated among 72 adults with anxiety issues. In all, two patients left the study after one week, citing fatigue. Another subject reported dry eyes, a common side effect in THC consumption. One patient with a developmental disorder was removed from the study after experiencing increased sexually inappropriate behavior. A 2018 study of medical cannabis flower and insomnia analyzed 1,056 self-administered reports from 409 patients using the Relief app. In 57% of sessions, users reported one or more adverse side effects. On the other hand, 95% reported at least one positive side effect. The study noted that consumers used a variety of cannabis strains with various THC and CBD potencies. In most cases, adverse side effects resembled that of THC consumption, like dry eyes. Another common side effect was fatigue, which of course is, in this case, the desired effect. Adverse side effects can also occur when combining cannabis with other medications, herbs, supplements, and foods. 
The U.S. National Library of Medicine published an extensive list of possible interactions with CBD. It also listed a series of medical conditions and symptoms many people use CBD for, noting that insufficient evidence makes it impossible to rate its effectiveness at this time. Cannabis has shown the potential to address many sleep issues for patients. Be it a sleep disorder or a symptom of another condition, cannabis appears to help scores of people fall asleep easier. That said, cannabis is not a one-size-fits-all solution, as some studies suggest that cannabinoids you consume may drastically alter your outcome. CBD appears to be the most recommended cannabinoid to try, often paired with the intoxicating THC. A number of other factors, from the strain and consumption method to dose and metabolism, can also influence how you may react to medical marijuana. As such, consult with your physician before using cannabis to treat a sleep disorder or disturbance. Great article from Conigma.com, Sleep and Cannabis. How does cannabis impact your sleep? THC, CBD, terpene profiles, what's in me? Oh, please explain to me. Cultivar Corner, Cultivar Corner, oh yeah. Cultivar Corner, please explain this stuff to me. On Cultivar Corner today, we are testing something from the company we haven't tried before. Tribal. Sell a fair amount of tribal product. And this one, I have to admit that I was intrigued by the name. If you've been a listener of the podcast for any length of time, you may remember my discovery of Quirkle <laughs> from the folks at Sitka. That was a couple of years ago. Became my absolute go-to as soon as I opened the jar or the bag. Just the aroma just hit me full on. I just loved the taste, smell, and effects of Quirkle. So this is Tribal Turple. Close enough? <laughs> enough similarities to make me think that it may have some ability to kind of catch up with where the Quirkle was. I have no idea about that at all. As I say, this is from Tribal. And this three and a half grams, I uh, picked this up from my Mendo subscription. And this is in a nitro tin. They kind of went quickly by the wayside, didn't they? There was so much excitement as people were coming out with the nitro tins, and we all thought it was pretty cool when you first opened it, as in this. I mean, that, that's a cool sound. But once you've opened it, it's really hard to keep the weed fresh in those nitrous tins. Hmm. Okay, so let's get into what we have here today. This is Turple from the folks at Tribal. And Turple is a hybrid strain of cannabis known for its sweet burst of orange flavor with undertones of gas and wood. Mm, definitely some orange notes there. Expect crystal-coated dense buds, deep purple sugar leaves, and bright amber pistils with elevated THC levels and a rich terpene profile. Let's get out the jeweler's loop. Take a gander at our little Turple here. And see what's in store for us as we take a peek. Oh, very frosty. Yes. We got ourselves fields of trichomes in these guys. It's not a bright green. I wouldn't call that a bright green in any stretch of the imagination. It's kind of more of a dark green in overall tones. My three and a half grams made up of one, two, three, four, about seven or eight buds. So not total popcorn buds, but not really big either. And what's my THC levels on this guy? It looks like I'm coming in on the bottom end of the scale. <laughs> 21 to 27% is the total THC. The total terpenes, uh, 2 to 5%. And yeah, I'm on the bottom end of both of those values. <laughs> my terpene total on this guy is 20 and my THC is 21.3. Now that's going to be interesting because a lot of the stuff we've done lately on Cultivar Corner has been in those high 20s and perhaps even in the 30s. So it'll be interesting to see what the effects of this are. It is a hybrid. Uh, terpenes are caryophylline, farnesine, humulene, and myrcene. And I'm definitely becoming a believer that anything that has some farnesine in it is going to have some of those candy notes. Hmm which is a bit of that orange that's coming through. So relaxing, fragrant, and euphoric. Here's the strain information, and this is a, a multiple cross. <laughs> we started out with the Girl Scout cookies and tangy. 
That became Slurricane number seven. On the other side, it started with Purple Punch and do si do which became Tropicana Cookies. So we put Slurricane number seven and Tropicana Cookies together, and we end up with Turple, a hybrid strain of cannabis bred by in-house genetics and crossed with the legendary Tropicana Cookies and Slurricane number seven. This hybrid results in large calyxes and heavy trichome, dense bud structure. Expect a smooth, orange, yet gassy smoke with a heavy head. And there really is a nice, dense bud structure. I have to give him credit on that. The cure is really nice, too. Uh, a little bit sticky. Hangs on to my finger when I put it down on the thing and try to pick that up. Always like a little sticky weed. The aromas, Turple's aroma is a complex with elements of sweet orange, sour citrus, and spicy diesel. With its high terpene percentages, although 2% isn't terribly high, you can expect a matching flavor intensity with notes of orange juice, earthy sandalwood, and breaths of gas. I think they spelled breaths wrong. <laughs> it's spelled as breathes of gas. <clears throat> but that's just a typo on the website. We won't worry too much about that. And as I said, uh, terpenes are caryophylline, farnesine, humulene, and myrcene. Mm, farnesine's got to be giving me those candy notes. Caryophylline, a bit of spicy pepper, and that myrcene, some earthy tones, and humulene just dialed in for extra measure. You know what? I think it's time we got something ready for the Crafty Plus, and we get our joint ready. As you break the buds open... Again, you get another perspective. Now, one thing I did want to start adding to my cultivar corners was the package date. Because I think that's... Oh, I wish I hadn't looked. <laughs> we are in June, right? This is June of 2023 when I'm recording this cultivar corner. <laughs> oh. Harvested on Halloween in 2022 and packaged on December 19th of 2022. So that means it had about a two-month cure. And then we got packaged. Let's see, that's over six months ago. <laughs> we want fresher weed, people. <laughs> and I guess that's part of the problem, isn't it? The turnover. Some LPs are getting their product out, and it's just not moving. So it sits on a shelf for six months before anybody has a chance to actually sample it. <laughs> I got enough from my joint. I'm just going to get a little bit more ready for my Crafty Plus, which is, oh, look at that. It's up to temperature now, so I should have some weed in it. It's a Saturday morning. This is my first hit of the day. And as we have talked about before, let's bring some intention into my cannabis use. What is my intention for what I am trying to do today? Well, I guess the first and foremost obvious intention is we're doing a review of Tribal Turple. What do we think the quality of the flower and the bud is? What do we think the effect of that is going to be? That's my true intention, to see whether or not it gives me a buzz. It's 21% THC. So I happen to have the Crafty ready. So in fact, I'm going to take my first hit off of that. Now let's get back to those aromas while I roll my joint. Turbo's aroma is complex with elements of sweet oranges, sour citrus, and spicy diesel. With its high terpene percentage, you can expect a matching flavor intensity with notes of orange juice, earthy sandalwood, and breeze of gas. <laughs> I'm sorry to harp on that typo there, but I just can't help it. <laughs> My brain goes and likes to identify oddities, and I think they mean breaths of gas, but it says breeze of gas, which to me doesn't make any sense. However, in that interim, I managed to roll my joint. <laughs> so while the crafty continues to heat up, let's give the joint of Turple a little try. Okay, now in the Crafty Plus... Get a bit of those citrus notes. So there's some of that orange, some of that sour citrus. And some gassy notes, I guess, on the exhale. Very tasty. Mm, yeah, very tasty. 
and then on the joint side and here I am again my THC is sitting at 21.3 percent terpenes at 2.0 and here come the happy eyes <laughs> Oh, I'm always so pleased with whatever I'm smoking to get enough of it into my endocannabinoid system and uh, I can start to feel my eyes reacting. Uh, very calming. Seems to be much of a body stone as at this point. A little bit in my head. Obviously a bit of euphoria happening up there. Relaxing, fragrant, and euphoric. I think I can agree with each one of those statements at this stage. So the intention to test the veracity of this particular cannabis and to prepare myself for doing another episode of the Cannabis Podcast. And that's coming up this weekend. So I better get to work. <laughs> Maybe I should stop smoking weed and actually do some work. No, <laughs> we wouldn't want to go down that path. Okay, I am pretty happy with what I'm experiencing so far. And again, the contrast, as we've been having these discussions about our THC getting so high, I sold some flour this week that was listed on the package at 35% THC. I don't understand how we've made our plants so much more intelligent in these last three years. It's a bit of a debate, isn't it? We're not suggesting that there's some falsification of data out there, but I think some people might be playing the numbers game a little bit. And we always have to remember it doesn't matter what THC is listed on the label. The relevant fact is, does it give you a buzz? <laughs> so I don't care whether this is listed at 21, 28, 29, 37. I'm getting some nice happy eyes. Got some really nice euphoria happening right now. It's a nice smooth hit both in the joint and in the vaporizer. Definitely pick up more of those citrusy notes when I choose the vaporizer. And then I guess on the exhale of the joint, that's when I'm picking up more of the gas. It's not corkle. It sounds a lot like it with a name like Turple. <laughs> but the effect... Very satisfying to this stage. Really nice euphoria sitting in my head right now. That's going to make my intent a lot easier to accomplish. Because <laughs> once we're finished this, I start to record the episode. All right. There's another one worthy of your sampling. This is from Tribal. It's called Turple. 21.3% THC. 2% terpenes. Not heavy on the aroma but very nice on the effect. Sharing stories about good weed while trying good weed. This is the Cannabis Podcast. Well, it was in the legislation that there would be a review of the Cannabis Act three years after legalization occurred. Well, we're a little past that point. <laughs> it is apparently underway, but a story from mjbizdaily.com suggests that internal documents raise some questions about Canada's Cannabis Act review. Hundreds of emails, documents, and reports obtained by MJ Biz Daily through a Canadian federal records request paint a more complex picture of the Cannabis Act review currently underway, a re-examination that could have far-reaching implications for operators in the country's $5.6 billion legal marijuana industry. A 1,700-page package of documents reveals fresh details about the government-appointed expert panel undertaking the review, in particular the group's tardiness in launching, the scope of the topics covered, as well as what's not covered, and the panel's level of independence from federal officials. Canada's landmark 2018 Cannabis Act, legalizing recreational marijuana, requires the federal health minister to initiate a review of the adult use legalization law three years after its passage and implementation, meaning the review ought to have kicked off in late 2021. But the review was ultimately launched nearly a year later, on September 22, 2022, with only one identified member, the chair, Morris Rosenberg, a former deputy minister under two federal governments. The trove of documents indicates the government's cannabis review was broadened at the behest of a minister's office in the immediate days after the panel was launched, 
though the documents don't reveal whether it was Health Minister Jean-Yves Duclos or Carolyn Bennett who made the request. Other insights from documents obtained by MJ Biz Daily's access to information and privacy request include an internal draft of the terms of reference, essentially the review's scope and limitations, contains significantly more detail than the scope and limitations that have been issued publicly. Other federal departments and agencies may undertake parallel, separate reviews beyond the ones stipulated by the Cannabis Act. Compensation for the panel's chair, almost $200,000 Canadian dollars and the expected workload. Instructions for the panel to create an Indigenous engagement plan to foster Indigenous participation in the review as well as a stipulation that the review be conducted in a manner that advances core principles outlined in UNDRIP, referring to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, a legally non-binding human rights instrument that details the rights of Indigenous peoples around the world, including in Canada. A requirement for the Cannabis Act Legislative Review Secretariat, the office housed at Health Canada, responsible for the panel's administrative affairs, to keep the panel informed of the findings and recommendations by the Federal Cannabis Strategy Table, which is a separate business-focused body. During the second phase of the panel's review, it will work with provinces and territories to identify priority areas for action that might have implications for their respective jurisdictions under the Cannabis Act. Cannabis industry officials are particularly interested in the panel's scope of work and its key areas of focus, which are laid out in the terms of reference. Those specific areas, such as the economic, social, and environmental impacts of the Cannabis Act, could lead to reform down the road that has major ramifications for the regulated industry. In particular, a large number of insolvent cannabis companies have cited the 2018 law's restrictions in their company's Creditors' Arrangement Act, the latest being the insolvent retailer Fire and Flower Holdings. Rahim Dalla, founder of Ottawa-based medical cannabis business Hybrid Farm, said knowing what the review process will consider is critical to the longevity of many industry operators. The documents obtained by MJ Biz Daily do not explain the nearly year-long delay to the review's launch. However, in a detailed answer to an MJ Biz Daily question about why the review was launched late, a Health Canada spokesperson said the Cannabis Act requires the review start three years after the law comes into force, but does not mandate the start date to be on the three-year anniversary. The spokesperson also said the chair was appointed first, as the vetting process continued for the rest of the panel members. This allowed time for the chair, working with the secretariat, to support the orientation for the expert panel and plan for future engagements, prior to the other panelists commencing in their roles as the vetting process continued. Health Canada's Andrea Budgel sent a June 17th email to Rosenberg, who would later become the panel's official chair, introducing herself as the director leading the Cannabis Act Legislative Review Secretariat. This appears to be when Rosenberg, previously a deputy minister under conservative and liberal governments, was prod into the review's fold. The June 2022 email contained a list of the four proposed members. One of the names and biographies of the four panelists is redacted. Then in early September, Rosenberg sent a draft email to Budgel outlining the government's intent to appoint an Indigenous member of the panel. The final list of panelists was not published until the end of November 2022, two months after the panel was officially launched. The panel members themselves lean heavily into academia and do not include any members with cannabis business experience. The appointed panelists were Oyedijai Ayanrinid, a consultant psychiatrist and associate professor in the Departments of Psychiatry and Psychology at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, Patricia Conrad, clinical psychologist and full professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Addiction at the University of Montreal, Linda Levesque, a criminal lawyer and member of the Fisher River Cree Nation in Manitoba, Treaty 5 Territory, Peter Selby, head of mental health and addictions in the Department of Family and Community Medicine in the University of Toronto. Rosenberg was expected to work 2.5 days, or 18.75 hours a week. The contract was set to end February 17, 2024. The chair would be given an office at a Federal Health Canada facility, and the contract is valued at $148,100. The internal terms of reference contain a detailed key deliverable section. Three of the deliverables outlined are the aforementioned status updates for the ministers, the What We Heard report, and the interim report. The panel's final report is supposed to be delivered to the ministers no later than 18 months after the establishment of the panel. That would translate to March 2024, unless the panel is extended. The panel will operate for 18 months after being confirmed, at which point the ministers could extend the participation of some or all panel members or appoint new members. And there is a bit more detail 
perhaps a bit more minutiae than you wanted, <laughs> in relation to the Cannabis Act review still underway, after we have had legalization now since October 17th, 2018. Thank you so much for being a listener of the podcast. I truly appreciate the fact that you are here. I also especially want to thank my supporters, Kevin and Jordana at buymeacoffee.com slash cannabis podcast. And on Patreon, my patrons, Rob, Tony, and Roger. Thanks for being here, guys. I truly appreciate the support. you find the links to both of those items at the top right when you're sitting on the show page. If you ever have a comment on anything you hear on the Cannabis Podcast, please send a note to info at CannabisPodcast.com. That's it for episode 127 of the Cannabis Podcast. From the Cannabis Infused Studio, high above the Okanagan Valley, this was the Cannabis Podcast. Thanks for listening to today's show. To check out more great cannabis podcasts, go to podconnects.com. Here's a preview of one of our other shows. I'm Joyce Gerber, the creator and host of the award-winning podcast, The Canna Mom Show. And we are on a mission to enhance the impact women have on this industry as business professionals, healthcare providers, policy advocates, caregivers, moms, by sharing and preserving their stories of love and kindness, wisdom, and hope. I am so grateful to have found my tribe of Canna podcasters right here on PodConX and look forward to our work of crushing the stigma around cannabis and caregivers and building this new industry together.